Thompson, and uh, I came here to the University of Connecticut a while ago now, about nine years, um, uh, from the game industry where I worked as a uh, game designer on uh, Marvel tie-in movie games. Um, and when I came here, can you go to the next slide, please? Um, we, uh, uh, Clarissa and I uh, got to talking, and we thought about what it would be like to engage in some more difficult histories through an interactive narrative. Uh, that's obviously where we're ending up. And those conversations started with uh, some tech demos. Um, and it also started with our discovery of the digital archives here. So in the Dodd uh, uh, Human Rights Center, um, we have the digital archives. It has uh, all of the paperwork from Thomas J. Dodd. He was the uh, lead uh, uh, prosecutor for a time at the International Military Tribunal at the Nuremberg Trials, um, the first set. Uh, and if, for those of you who are not aware, um, because this is a question we get in our classroom a lot, um, or uh, what is the Nuremberg Trials, uh, which is kind of surprising, but um, something that we've realized um, is part of interactive narrative is kind of describing something to a new um, uh, generation of people and uh, the the Nuremberg trials was where we put on uh, Nazi war criminals who were the uh, the uh, leadership of the uh, Nazi military and thought leaders, um, and we tried them for crimes against humanity amongst uh, three other counts. So um, I'm. Go ahead. Uh, oh, can you go next one, please? So the um, oh, one back there we go. So this is the digital archives, just as a as an example. Um, and one of the aspects of this is we digitized all of the paperwork that he brought back with uh, him, as well as several artifacts and archives. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to Tom to talk about how this work kind of uh, turned into a greenhouse studios project. Hi, um, I'm Tom Lee. I'm a design technologist at Greenhouse Studios. So I'm actually uh, full time staff at Greenhouse Studios. And so I should probably explain what Greenhouse Studios is a little bit. Um, we are basically a research incubator focusing on the digital humanities. We live in the library somewhere up there. Um, you can't see it because there's like walls and ceilings. Um, <laughs> And uh, so what makes us unique at Greenhouse Studios is that we focus on doing our own sort of internally developed um, projects. And as key aspects of those, we focus on collaboration and design. So collaboration, how we view that is we get everyone, the whole team together on page one, like the first day. So uh, we bring together faculty, students, uh, staff, which can include someone like myself or a libra librarian or both. Um, and yeah, we, um, we follow a design process that's based on the principles of design thinking. So it's sort of an iterative, um, but not linear process that has, you know, distinct stages, um, like understanding your problem, understanding the audience, actually building the thing, preparing it for review and dissemination and release. Um, so um, yeah, as I understand, Courtroom 600 existed as an independent uh, project before becoming uh, a Greenhouse Studios project, but uh, this is just one example of, uh, you know, our projects have different sort of um, life cycles, and this is just uh, uh, one example of one that sort of came as an opportunity, as something that we could sort of bring into our greenhouse nest and nurture and uh, watch it grow into something fabulous, so. Good morning, everyone. I'm Clarissa Seglio. I'm the Associate Director of Research for Greenhouse Studios and also an Associate Professor, yeah, professor I can say this thing, uh, of Digital Humanities in our School of Fine Arts, Digital Media and Design Department. I'm a public historian. I have a background uh, prior to academia as a writer an advertising copywriter, a medical technology writer, a public communications writer in museums, tech startup firms. So 
as a writer, history was the place where I felt that I could work with existing stories rooted in fact. And when I met Ken and we began talking about the trial documentation for the major war criminals trial, the first uh, Nuremberg trial, 1945 to 46, this is where the beauty of interdisciplinarity, and I think that's what we're really eager to answer questions about today. How do you work with colleagues in other disciplines? Those of us on the stage are just a small sample of the humanities advisors, the other full-time team members, and the cast of undergraduate and graduate researchers who are contributing to this project. As many of you know, the teams are large and uh, coordinating that, uh, talking with a colleague about going after grant funding to get things like this off the ground. To take a step back, this is a headset-based virtual reality interactive puzzle-solving quest that sends the player across time to discover primary sources in their moment, to contextualize them, to understand them as material sets of information that exist across time, and to begin to put together a story related to our first mission which deals with the occupied Eastern territories where the defendant Alfred Rosenberg was in charge of and today is the site of Russia's invasion of the Ukraine. And through piecing together, learning how to read a primary source, how to ask questions of it to elicit more content and information, the player will be led to a survivor story. And the key things that we want to emphasize in terms of our design pillars, our humanities themes, is that Holocaust history, the history of the Nuremberg trials is not static. There are records in Yiddish that have yet to be translated and broadly studied. There are records held by various countries that have not yet been analyzed. What we know of this history is in motion. That understanding of the role of women, both in the trials and in survival of the Holocaust, as well as Jewish resistance, are parts of the story that need to be known. It's been said that the Holocaust uh, was an act against civilization, but scholars point out that it's the very me mechanisms of civilization, the press, the courts, the legal system, that makes this kind of genocide possible. And lastly, our hope is through learning about this history and the uh, ideas of collecting information, asking questions of information, putting together understanding based on that information, the player as learner develops a greater degree of discernment, but also we hope begins to understand as we connect the historic moment to ongoing work in these areas, becomes motivated to understand that the ideas of justice and reconciliation, just like the history itself, continue to unfold. And I think I know that we want to really focus on questions and maybe less about us. Uh, Although I'd like to give uh, Mackenzie one of uh, Mackenzie began as an undergraduate researcher in greenhouse studios, working on multiple projects, uh, and now is a professional in her own right. And maybe you can talk a little bit, Mackenzie, about the process of coming on to a new project and and how you found your place in a, in a 
already moving vehicles, so to speak? Um, that's a really great question. So this was a unique experience to me coming on to a project that had already started. Um, but I felt like honestly going into it through greenhouse studios really helped because I was able to use all these practices that I learned at greenhouse, this multi tiered process of developing a project and kind of backtrack in my own, like individual experience with courtroom to fully understand it. And of course, Stephen introduced himself uh, as part of the team. And when we get to thinking about the educational outcomes and impacts, Stephen's work in this area is uh, pivotal. Yeah, my primary operation as part of this project is to help do the instructional design components. So thinking through how do you connect the learning objectives to the game objectives? And what does it mean for a player in this virtual reality space to act on these skills we want them to develop, whether that's critical discernment of these documents or the actual practices that an investigator uses when doing archival research. And that actually leads nicely into the first question we had had, which was, um, in what ways do uh, we use player interactivity to make deeper and more meaningful experiences than reading something like a document or reading a book or, or watching a documentary? And so, Ken, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, uh, well, one of the aspects of this project is that, um, you know, learning is often at our own pace and uh, engaged learning can can occur when people are interested in, in a topic. So uh, one of the aspects of what we need to do is to provide um, the context of where these documents are coming from within the virtual reality experience. Uh, we're also harvesting, you know, metadata from this digital archive and from the other archives at our partner institutions at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and the Illinois Holocaust Memorial Education Center. Boy, uh, all the uh, mm -hmm. museum education. I knew I got it wrong. Um, uh, so, um, so working on touching and having a tactile interactive uh, response to these documents and being able to also examine some of the data and how they're connected to other aspects of you know the story and narrative um, are, are really beneficial and in a way that uh, Steve can definitely speak more eloquently to um, and for what we're doing here we're also really focusing on making sure that uh, people who are using this project understand where these objects are coming from and that they are actually real. Uh, however, uh, one thing and one aspect of these objects that the uh, that we have a, um, it, uh, an issue with is that much of it is not um, uh, touchable the the original object is not something that you have access to that's something that we have in an archive um, and you actually will receive a facsimile of it a xerox copy of that object if you were to go to our archive and ask for that uh, so th uh, the there is a story to tell in this rice paper thin um, uh, you know, uh, notes and between the margins where there are people uh, um, adding comments and other things to the documentation. Um, and um, is that kind of answer it? Does anyone have anything else to add? Ken touched on something that I think also emphasizes this project is research uh, and how development of this sort of game is different than if we were in industry, for example. I talked about the fact that working with multiple disciplines exposes us to the things that we're blind to because it's commonplace in our own discipline. When Ken told me that within the VR experience, he could go out to the website and bring the website into VR, to me, I suddenly wondered and we began to discuss in the future, right now we know if I wanna to go to a digitized collection, whether it's the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum's very robust online collection, the Dodd Papers, we're at a browser interface. Anything three-dimensional is two-dimensional. If it's the front and back of a photograph, we've got two separate images. In the future, will we as researchers put on our VR goggles 
and thumb through collections as if we had access to the archives back rooms. Nobody needs to worry about us touching things, putting things in an order that's meaningful to us or taking it out of a folder and not putting it back? Or is it even in folders? Uh, Ken often references some of the Star Trek ways of organizing big digitized collections. So part of the question we're also asking is, in the future, will we not go to the web browser-based archive access if we can't go to the reading room, will we be going to the virtual reading room? And will we have different kinds of freedoms to cull materials across collections in ways that we cannot do in a physical reading room or which are laborious uh, in a browser-based reading room? So, sorry, side detour, but that's one of the things that excites me as a researcher. And just to describe what this item is behind us, um, it's the headset of Alfred Rosenberg, specifically his headset, the translation set that he used from IBM um, during the trials, uh, which we were allowed access to as part of, uh, this is a, an item in the, the physical objects collection, I believe they call it, or um, the... I can't remember exactly at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Um, so we had to go to a separate building um, and they pulled it out of uh, storage for us and allowed us to kind of take a look. So, you know, obviously not something that um, uh, is what everyone has access to, ha yet these objects exist. So how do we take, um, how do we take that 90% of archives that are behind the museum and bring it into the, for in into, uh, into the public view again? Um, in, in a way that's also, um, you know, manageable. Ken, this would be a good follow-up question for you. Can you describe the gameplay loop and what does a session actually look like for somebody who's participating, especially because this question focuses on agency. So does the player or user actually have control over the outcome of the trial, which I think, uh, okay, so. We have a slide for that. Is on our interactive? Um, Oh, there, there it is. Interactive loop. Hey, good question. Um, so uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna cheat a little and turn around. But um, so so one of the aspects of this is that you know you're you're put into this room. Uh, one thing we all may have in if we've put a headset on, um, everyone wants to touch everything and pick up everything immediately. And what better way to do that uh, than to allow users to start to collect objects start to understand what they are uh, we'll be giving them a prompt as to what their current goal is and that will kind of move and change um, and from there uh, we're going to be able to go to different locations that are going to be related to the nuremberg trial so one aspect of this is like oh are you going to you know just redo the court drama and you know we kind of thought about it but realized that the Nuremberg trials is kind of a lens that we're looking through all of history and all of the history that touches this event. Um, so users will be prompted, uh, players will be prompted to travel to different sites that are based on the items and where they're coming from, because, you know, as we know, uh, a trial is also a collection of items. Um, we want to make sure that it was clear and this is something we discussed with partners as well as advisors and uh and agency is one aspect of this that's also really critical you know we we discussed and uh, uh thought about well should a player be able to change the history or change what happened should they have agency in that way um are they merely an observer uh, and what we came to is kind of an understanding that there is kind of a transgression when we start playing with history and what actually happened while also providing source materials. Uh, and so our project is, um, is approaching this with, you know, a lack of uh, ability to change the past. So we're going to be examining artifacts, but we're not also going to just examine the 19, the trial items. Uh, later on, we have um, a testimony that was uh, provided uh, and is a video testimony in the 70s, I think it was recorded. So that item, although not evidence in a, in a, in a, courtroom sense is also an aspect of what we're bringing into it and is part of the curated set of documents or media that we're trying to provide. 
Can we take live questions or only? Live? Yeah, we can do that. I have one more that I wanted to follow up on uh, some digital submissions. One of them is how do you break this into smaller units? So obviously the Holocaust and World War II are enormous bodies of information. And the only people who realistically have time to filter through all of these documents in an archive are either faculty at a university or grad students. So how do we make this sort of thing accessible to a broader audience who doesn't have that level of time or proficiency with archival research? And what do you imagine? And I think this is a good question for you, Clarissa, since you're kind of organizing the artifacts for the particular narrative we're telling. Um, how do you think about the uh, what to include, what not to include, or how to direct users through that information flow? Yes. Uh... As Ken mentioned, we originally started in a very trial-like fashion. Let us pick a defendant, Alfred Rosenberg, not as well known as, say, Goering or some of the others. But that put the focus on the perpetrator. And that is, by necessity, what trials do. And as we came to the place of understanding that I can watch a video remediation of original trial footage. We do not want to change the outcome of the verdict of this historic trial. And that what we were really more interested in were the stories of survival and that these were what is revealed at the end of the labor of piecing together a story. So we shifted from Alfred Rosenberg to his crimes, and then looking at our themes of Jewish resistance, we settled on uh, the testimony that Ken spoke of uh, that's related to the uprising in Tuchin and uh, a moment where, as a young boy, Herman is his first name, remembers when Rosenberg came to his village. And so then it becomes, to get to this final story, what are some of the pieces that the player needs to know about this place, Tuchin, what's happening in the occupied Eastern Territory. We're looking at that theme of systems of civilization perpetuating genocide. We get Germanization. One of the ways that Germanization happened was through the issuing of Nazi currency in these occupied territories. So we have a piece of occupation currency issued in the territory that also has its own history. It's issued during the period of the trial. Germanization is discussed in the trial, but this particular occupation note is discovered in the 80s as part of investigation into mass graves. So for me, as a historian who's worked in museums, who works with museums, it's how do the sources as pieces of material culture that each have their own biographies, how do these set of individual material objects, trial papers, currency notes, survivor testimony, Rosenberg's book, Myth of the 20th Century. How do these pieces come together to fill in the context that lets us understand the moment that we highlight in Herman's testimony of uprising and survival in the occupied Eastern Territory? And this is where the time travel comes in. The individual may go back in time to before the war and discover Rosenberg's book. Going forward in time, the book is part of the trial. It's also the source of 
anti-Semitic ideology that we then connect to Herman, who in his testimony talks about Rosenberg as the author of much of the poisonous ideology. That even as a young boy, or we know with oral history, maybe later he comes to understand who this Rosenberg was. Uh, so those are some of the ways that to keep the focus tight, because the occupied Eastern territory, the Holocaust by bullets is huge, but it starts with the survivor's focus and how to contextualize that and make that meaningful across time. So another way to think about this is that the learning objectives are sort of uh, conical or a hierarchical where you have the broad learning objectives associated with the Holocaust and World War II that then get divided down into smaller learning objective chunks that are then broken into individual activities. And so courtroom 600 isn't designed to function as a full read of all of these events. It's instead focused on these particular actions by these particular individuals as they fit into a broader structure to get at this broader learning objective about the inhumanity of the system that allowed it to occur. And actually, that brings us to a, uh, a related question that I, I think is worth touching on uh, before we finish up, which is, how do you convince a teacher or a parent that this is a good thing for their child to experience? And uh, I have some thoughts on this, but I'd be happy to let Ken jump in, uh, especially because this is something we debated amongst ourselves for quite a while when we started this project. So go ahead. Yeah, uh, they're already engaging in this history and mock trials and other uh, embodied learning uh, uh, systems. And high school teachers, in fact, is where we started. Uh, I, I had a student who happened to hear that we were working on this project and he was like, oh, I went through a mock trial. Let me get you m the materials in my high school teacher's name and email and all that. Um, so there are, you know, ways in which we need to talk about serious topics and we need to be able to break that down and this kind of engaged learning will be meeting students where they're at in a technology that they're comfortable with um, not many uh, kids really even watch tv anymore or long form movies i think um, although maybe the new top gun will change that but uh um and, and so you know we're really looking to create something that would uh, that would you know engage students and when we bring the uh, bring out a, a small tech demo um, and we discuss this with other uh, high school and learning groups as well we've had a lot of positive feedback um, and that's possible is possibly because we've also been seeing a lot of laws about requirements like for instance in Connecticut I think it was in 2019 we passed a, a state law about requiring genocide uh, um, history uh, education. Now, what that really means depends on where you're at and what state you're at. New Jersey has a very descriptive set of educational goals for the, uh, the Holocaust specifically um, and for that to that aim. Um, so these are, you know, and these are things that are gonna, going to be in the classroom. I would add too that we're in the prototype stage. Things are still formative. In terms of the initial experience, we're imagining the 18 or older set as we build the prototype and we do user testing we will be collaborating with the united states holocaust memorial museum we want to test it with survivors with children of survivors with people who have stakes in how this history is represented we need to honor these individuals in approaching this carefully Headsets will primarily be the at-home user to begin with. That's why we're looking at the 18 and older. As we're able to go into production, we want to look at low-cost, smartphone-compatible VR viewers. Ultimately, uh, following the example of the Anne Frank House VR app, looking at doing a browser-based experience that perhaps is designed for educators in classroom settings. So lots of possibilities and things yet to be tested and answered. As younger than us people, I don't know if you have a thought on uh, the kinds of things uh, that younger sets have engaged with or your perspectives on this question. <laughs> Tom's like, I'm not young anymore. <laughs> um, sure, yeah. 
I, I think this kind of thing is worthwhile and a lot of games and interactive media um, should be following a similar example and making it more accessible to people my age and younger who their future is going to be engaging more and more with technology. And I think that this project is a great way of, you know, being at the forefront of what's to come. We're mindful too of what Susan Sontag called the fascination with fascism. Are we glorifying the perpetrators? One of our decisions is in rendering perpetrators, they will only look as they looked in the historic documents. So Alfred Rosenberg will look as Alfred Rosenberg looked at any particular moment in his biography, according to a primary source photograph, if that's part of the experience. Our goal, if he might be encountered in the trial, is do we play around with more ghostly, not quite present gray shades, uh, specters? Uh, we certainly are mindful of how, again, fascism and Nazism doesn't need reassertion when our focus is on genocide, justice, and the ongoing work of reparation. All right, so uh, because we're kind of running up to our first set of pre breakout presentations, I do want to kind of wrap things up. So I want to invite all of you to give any parting thoughts or ideas, things that you'd like people to know about this project or where they can learn more. Yeah, um, well, I, I think one of the things is we're really working diligently to uh, make sure that this is the right experience and what uh, Clarissa was saying about, you know, working on multiple um, SKUs, multiple releases of different sets of information is really part of the process that the Shoah Foundation is also going forward with with their interviews um, with survivors. They're, they're thinking about collecting a set of data and a set of information that the, they can provide to others through various means. The Last Goodbye is a virtual reality uh, project that they did, but um, they also have a, uh, a uh, holographic interactive person um, to whom they can talk with, um, who is a survivor. So there's a lot of different things out there. And uh, what we're doing here in academia is, I think, something valuable that is really hard to replicate in an entertainment setting. Um, as we can kind of see, it's, a, it's very difficult to work through some of this um, uh, in order to understand what is you know the right approach so it's been uh, um, a, a, a challenging journey so far and I we're really excited to continue so towards from either of you Stephen you haven't had a lot of yeah. chance to talk before. I'm on mic I can yeah uh, so it, last word come ask us questions uh, go to greenhouse studios.org look on the projects tab and you'll find the courtroom 600, flip, click the card, it'll flip over, click about read more, and you can watch a video and read some articles, et cetera. Yeah, I'll just add very briefly that in the community arcade this evening, we'll have an HTC Vive set up. So if you'd like to see what the prototype looks like, at least to explore that space and get a sense of what we're trying to accomplish, you'll be able to try it out for yourself. So, um, and and it certainly, as Clarissa said, if you have questions for any of us about our roles on the project or what we're trying to accomplish with it, please do feel free to pull us aside during lunch or dinner or just break out uh, to chat more about this. Or we can do an unconference session about some related topic like the ethics of creating a difficult subject in, as a video game, right? So um, thank you all very much for your uh, participation in this. Thank you for your questions. And what we're going to do now is transition into our breakout sessions, our presentations by our, our guest presenters. Uh, those will take place upstairs in rooms 119, 125, and 127. Uh, we'll probably take five minutes or so to go up there and get things settled. So please feel free to migrate, grab a snack, use the restroom, and we will see you momentarily. <laughs>